Okay, let's do this. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Um, I'm going to kick off with the uh, the agenda, and uh, I pasted it in the chat there. Uh, if you don't have it, uh, someone can repaste uh, while I'm going through this. Um, so basically, uh, it's the end of November, which means end of release three. Um, and so I've been compiling a list of release three accomplishments um, and trying to correctly attribute uh, work uh, that's been done uh, over time to them. So um, I would like to just go ahead and have a look over that, over what we've gotten done in the last uh, six months, because I think it's pretty great. I want to make sure that you guys all have a chance to edit this. So this first link here... Click this should get you over to this document here, open one of these three accomplishments. I hope. I don't see anybody in there yet though. Uh the link working for you guys. Anybody able to click this link? Let's see. Are folks getting access issues or uh I just trying to edit it to change something it doesn't let me. Let me share it with everybody. Uh, oh, yeah, it says this thing works. Uh, anyway. Is it your machine? Because this is hung as well. Some, for some reason, Google Drive sometimes, even though you put stuff into a folder, um, doesn't have all of the doesn't have all the right permissions. Anyway. So what are we supposed to be looking at in Google Drive? Supposed to be looking at the OpenWorm release three accomplishments. When I hit Google Drive, all I get is my own Google Drive. And if I click shared with me. No 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 no, no. hold on. Uh, there's a link on that uh, on that agenda. Oh, I see. Okay, I see what you mean. Yep, yeah. that's fine. Sorry, I'm being stupid. No, 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 no. If you have a question, other people are going to have a question too. Um, okay, I moved it into another folder that I hope everybody has access to. Okay, yeah, try that. Try uh, refreshing the page uh, for edit access. Um, Does everybody have access now? Or anybody might have access would be the phone. Only. Yeah, I only I have a, I have read only access. I'll share you explicitly. Um, I won't write anything anyway. So, I, well, I never have. I have never wanted to be. <laughs> so. Well, you're free to. Uh, or make any edits. Anyway, okay, I just wanted to walk through this, right? So um, basically, I've tried to capture the things we've accomplished uh, in the last six months um, and, uh, and just try to reflect uh, the progress that we've made. Um, so here's, here's what I came up with. Uh, and if you see things that are missing or if the attribution is wrong, please just go ahead and edit it. Um, you know, something that's not there. So I think the theme of this, uh, of this release was that we shot for the we shot for the stars. Um, we didn't always hit exactly the target that we wanted to make, but we made a lot of progress um, over this period of time. And I'm excited that we got done. So um, the first epic. So I've got this broken up into epics, um, and some other accomplishments as well that weren't neatly under an epic, but were awesome. Uh, papers, including graphs, presentations that got made, and then uh, external write-ups uh, that folks. Um, Wrote, as well as uh, things that kind of largely fall under community building. Um, I try to attribute most of these things some, some things that have it. So um, one of the epics was um, being able to mark synapses and have them integrated into the model. Made a lot of progress on this in the last six months. Um, Lab Kuznetsov came into the project, helped us out a lot with this, uh, setting up a CatMate server on Amazon EC2, which is running right now. Um, we loaded up uh, an EM image data set uh, from actual C. elegans data, which we didn't even have before. Um, that was largely due to uh, Stephen Cook's donation. I uh, put his name under here as well. Um, 
from the Emmons lab, which is the, one of the few active uh, labs that are doing EM on, on CL plugins. We got them to work with us. Uh, we created user accounts so folks could work with that. Uh, Steve Cook also created an initial uh, orientation tutorial. Uh, there's a mailing list now for those of you interested um, where we're fleshing that project out. Um, we worked on parsing the existing Synapse position data structure, actually, and, uh, and we wrote a scaffold to export that uh, Synapse position database. So Tim and Sergey both uh, helped with that process. Um, and so, um, we're basically, where we are is we've uh, got to motivate the community now to actually use this tool uh, that we've put up. But we're um, we're well ahead of where we were when we started. Um, and uh, I just got an email from Stephen today saying that he's going to be finishing the Synapse part of that tutorial and moving that forward. Again, the whole purpose of this is uh, that there are two missing pieces from the current C. elegans connectome that we have. One is the positions of the synapses relative to the cells, and the other are the exact ion channels and the parameters of, of those ion channels. And that um, basically makes up uh, two other large chunks of the project that we are what are we talking about? Okay. Um, I'm just going to keep going. If I'm, anybody has any comments or questions about any of the epics, uh, how they went, um, uh, please ask now. Um, I'll reserve topics related to the future of any of these projects until the next section where we'll start talking a little bit more about, about the future. Um, so let me, I'll just keep going. All right. Epic 2. Um, as a developer, I want to launch a simulation engine on Amazon AWS. Um, so this actually got done in the last two weeks. Um, so I actually got the simulation running on an AWS instance on crash issue that we still have to resolve. Um, but that uh, was set up. It was coded off a little bit last time. Um, it was tested. We realized some issues that, that uh, have come up with regards to multi-user, um, uh, you know, multi-user functionality. Uh, but that was good if we got that off. Um, we also created a script to pull together all the packages of the simulation engine into a single package. And uh, if you click out to some of these links, uh, you'll see the Python script that uh, you can try out yourself. Uh, um, uh, there's some notes at the top of how to set up your environment to make that work. Um, also here, if you link, there's um, there are some instructions for how to get that set up. Uh, so one of the pieces right now is OpenCL um, uh, drivers are sometimes a bit of a problem. So the next step from this is to actually, well, uh, I said I was going to leave next steps uh, to the future. But basically, right now, Simulation Engine runs on AWS, and there is a package you can download to run it locally on a, on a given system following the instructions that are All right. Um, Epic 3. As a user, I want to be able to see the body of the worm moving and changing color, driven by activity of the Simulation Engine. We call this sort of a simplified worm. So this is one of the examples of, of something that we uh, really want to have, um, is something that we realize that there's a, several prerequisites for getting to. Um, I think this is sort of a motivating challenge. Um, it actually causes a creation of Epic 7. Um, and, uh, and so basically, that just got accomplished towards the end of this uh, in our drive towards that uh, larger goal. So um, we haven't really accomplish this, um, but we have made progress in that we've got this really important key record data accomplished, um, which is the uh, SPH visualization. I'm going to hear a little bit of keys clacking on keyboards if you aren't talking in my one Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and then uh, the NeuroML visualizer that we've seen uh, being produced for Open Source Brain. Um, obviously, Open Source Brain um, is going to be the future you know, of that. We're hoping to use that on the road be very helpful for this kind of thing. So um, we, we made progress in that we accomplished Epic 7. Um, I think this is still obviously on the table for you know, what we really want to see getting done, either something simplified or something that's you know, hard to do. Uh, actually, Stephen, sorry. Sorry, okay, just. Yes? Just this boring small bite. This is, the open source, this is the open source brain site running on uh, Mateo's laptop, visualizing uh, one of the cells in C. elegans. It can't visualize the whole thing because it's only a mobile phone, but basically it can browse, it can stream it to any uh, WebGL supporting browser, including this on Android, not uh, Apple iPhone, but um, yes, so it can um, 
visualize any NeuroML file on open source brain on lots of different browsers. Wow. That is really awesome. That is really sexy. And I'm glad that this stuff, you know, that is, is coming out of all of these activities are uh, making their way out of the world. So that's going to be huge for not just open worm, but for all the projects under open source brain and, and the computational community. That's, that's very cool. I've been waiting for WebGL on my iPhone. Uh, yes, Android is um, a little bit more open, but uh, it is moving forward. Isn't it? That's really awesome, guys. Congratulations. That's great. OK, um, let me keep going here. Lots to go through. OK, um, so that's on its way. So Epic 4, uh, as a user, I want to be able to run a simulation that includes muscle cell physics as well as muscle cell membrane excitability. So um, we made huge strides with SPH physics uh, in, the last, uh, in the last release. Um, we implemented it with surface tension for both soft bodies and liquids. Um, we all know Andre and Sergey are the masterminds behind this. Uh, Jinzi Yu, I understand, also made some contributions with surface tension. But um, it's really been uh, you know, incredible amount of work from you guys basically hacking you know, bits and bytes there to, to get this algorithm to work without much of a guide. Um, sort of, uh, you know, basically making the first serious uh, PCI SPH uh, open source implementation uh, you know, that exists anywhere. Uh, so that's been that's been really exciting. Uh, what we've gotten in in the last several weeks has been um, I don't know if Mike has really been sleeping in the last two weeks. Um, because, uh, we'll also talk about some of the optimized stuff that he did later. But he also got at least a code base integration between uh, the parameter code base that connects uh, the muscle cell um, model and, um, and uh, the SPH code base. And I understand that there's still the need of having actually hooks that, that put the two together. But um, this initial integration, at least, um, was also you know, the work that happened uh, in this last period. So, um, so that's exciting. I have uh, a little bit later on talking about the actual muscle cell model creation your Epic 6, but that might also go here under Epic 4. But, um, so we are a lot closer to being able to run um, a, a muscle cell that has both physics and muscle cell membrane excitability than we were when we got started. Remember when we got started, we didn't even have something that looked like a muscle uh, operating in uh, SPH. We didn't have any kind of, uh, well, we had a, uh, a differential equations model uh, of, the, of the muscle cell, but nothing implemented in, in the ML. So the NeuroML implementation yeah, is also uh, so um, bravo to those guys for, for Epic 4 um, making fun of that. OK, Epic 5. So we met uh, and we sort of said, we really want to summarize what exists in the physiology. Uh, and, um, and I think what, where our original target was we wanted actually this to be a write-up. And I think that's still good. Um, since then, we've actually found several reviews uh, that, um, that do summarize physiology, but what I think when, as Tim and I have been discussing this, what we realize is that um, in order to really understand what the gaps are, we kind of have to lay everything out in a, in a grid. And so we've been um, working, both of us, to uh, compile data. Obviously, Tim takes the lead on this stuff. I was writing a uh, Worm Atlas screen scraper uh, over the weekend, and, and I was pulling additional information to these spreadsheets to really understand where the gaps are. Um, so the, the first step of this has been to uh, lay out all of the, um, you know, lay out all the neurons first, um, understand what we know about all of the um, receptors uh, that are there, and so that has that has been compiled into the spreadsheet that is on Google Drive. Um, we are also working on a process. I am working on a process, and and, and we'll continue to work on it where. We'll sync the uh, GitHub spreadsheet with what's in Google Drive, so that's uh, so there's no nothing out of sync there. Um, but bottom line, there is more metadata now for all of the neurons, and that should be integrated in with the uh, NeuroML model uh, soon. Um, so um, uh, specifically, there's um, the type of the neuron as reported in Worm Atlas. There's the location of the neuron as reported in Worm Atlas. Um, and there is a description of the cell, as reported in Worm Atlas, which includes links um, to references, which is very cool. And uh, we also have the capacity now to in inline the information about the receptors uh, that are known, 
Um, and that's going to be the subject of, I think, more work in, in release four. But um, so that is ongoing. Um, there will also, I think, um, I've actually been invited to write up a review on some of this stuff myself uh, in collaboration with David Dalrymple's um, due in March of, 20, of 2013. So, um, so this is, so we are um, on target and, and really a lot of the prelim work of, of compiling the data was necessary before we could write anything in prose. Um, so that, that made good progress. All right, uh, Epic 6, uh, as a user, I want to see optimized data matching experimental results. Um, so I think a lot of you saw what Mike posted on uh, the mailing list. Uh, bravo, Mike, again, uh, not sleeping in the last uh, couple weeks. Um, I think this was sort of a pulling off over the weekend. Um, but that was, that was actually a result of a lot of people's effort um, over the last uh, six, six months. Um, so parsing the Igor data that we got contributed by the Francis lab. So, um, so, that, so Mike actually parsed it. I guess we should also um, cite Dennis from the Francis lab, uh, whose last thing I, I don't have right in front of me, but I'll, we'll, we'll get that. Um, and then, of course, the work to actually build a NeuroML compatible muscle model and publish that um, on Open Source Brain and GitHub. So Borg, Mike, and Alex um, did really great work uh, uh, implementing that uh, when the equations to use were, you know, non-standard. Jumping through the, the, the hoops to, to get that working uh, was awesome. Uh, that then got integrated with uh, the Framel framework, which Mike was working on over. The, thank you, uh, which Mike was working on uh, with the Google Summer of Code project. Um, and that was an important piece then to be able to, um, you know, both do the, um, the physics integration as well as running optimization uh, for muscle cell against that parse data. And uh, the trace that uh, Mike, the traces that Mike uh, produced, uh, show that end-to-end -end, uh, optimization. Um, you know, he's um, he's published the, the caveats on that, and obviously we want to continue to iterate. But uh, having that, uh, you know, with actual data um, is obviously you know, the gold standard that we need here uh, in order to uh, demonstrate that we're not just hacking code, but we're actually um, you know, relevant to uh, what's going on in the biological reality here. So bravo to all those folks uh, for doing that. All right, and then Epic 7, the one that came out of the reach goal of uh, Epic 3. Um, I want to see a WebGL visualization of smooth particle hydrodynamics. Um, so, um, Matteo, Giovanni, Sergey, Andre, Leb, uh, all responsible for this uh, awesome work, which is now visible in the simulation engine. Um, so, obviously, you know, for doing, for moving the SPH algorithm development forward, again, Sergey and Andre implementing it in C, uh, preparing that algorithm for integration. Uh, Giovanni, Sergey, um, I'm sure Matteo also played a role in that. Um, implementing the WebSocket streaming, which was um, the thing which is sort of non-intuitive to get a server to be talking to the browser. Uh, Matteo and Gleb both uh, worked hard on that. Giovanni probably also played a role. Um, and then finally, um, you know, checking off the box between Matteo and Giovanni to get um, that SPH working uh, in the back end. And I think we're still working to get the latest version of SPH implemented. Um, but it is uh, still doable that, that you can stream from the back end to the front end. Uh, with SPH and have that uh, rendered in WebGL. Um, remember, when we started this, we had none of that. Uh, no particles, uh, you know, no WebGL implementation on the front end. Uh, none of that existed uh, when we started this. So congrats to all those guys uh, for getting that. Done. OK. Um, again, feel free to jump in. Any questions, um, issues um, that uh, Anything that uh, you think should be listed here that, that isn't listed or any, any uh, work uh, should be attributed. Uh, things which didn't fit directly under those, I mean, maybe actually uh, data collection fits under the compilation, but Tim, you know, has continued to work on, um, on data collection. He and I continue to meet on a regular basis, um, and this uh, goes into many of the spreadsheets you guys see popping up in uh, Dropbox frequently. Um, so he's really, in the last six months, dived into um, into the intracellular stuff. Um, we had that uh, car model um, that car model hangout where we got to talk to the authors of folks who had built a whole cell computational model, and we really took that to heart for diving in past what we are currently capable of simulating uh, with our with our infrastructure now, but looking at what would be required. 
Um, that work continues to be ongoing, but we have we know a lot more now than we did when we started about where we can get access to these data and, and some starting spreadsheets which do that. So um, Tim is always um, awesome work getting this stuff pulled together. Um, there have been a lot of adjustments and refinements to the to the Connectome that we that we um, that we basically published for the first time at the end of the last release. Um, Porig and Tim. Uh, thank you for those things, and and you know, Pora continues to update um, with scripts uh, and um, you know, make adjustments to that. Um, so it's been really great to continue to have your your work and help um, on on driving that forward. Um, we've moved code to the GitHub repository. I think that basically happened in this in this release. I don't think we really had done that uh, completely, at least uh, by the last release. So a lot of folks help out with that. Thank you for that. And then. Um, I think both both Matteo and Giovanni has played a role, but but Giovanni has really been the, the keeper of the website, continuing to push out uh, updates as as they've been needed, uh, adding folks to the, the people's list, um, and uh, and and as well, uh, you know, helping with, with social media stuff. So thank you to Giovanni for for doing those things and keeping those things going. Um, getting towards the end here, um, so papers. Uh, so we got a publication out. Um, in in silico biology, um, this was this represented something that uh, had been a burning desire for I know Andre, Sergey, and Alex for quite a while, uh, getting the um, Cyber Elegance paper published. Uh, I jumped in on some editing, but really it was those guys' persistence uh, getting that published. Uh, we got several mentions of Openworm in that paper, um, so I think that's been really great. Um, thanks to you guys for you know pushing on that, and you know, that's something that uh, we continue to cite. Um, you know, in, in our uh, in our ongoing work, uh, we've got a great start for a white paper draft that Balash has spearheaded, and I think you saw an email just this morning for you know moving those steps forward and, and a target for where that can be published. Um, and uh, you know, again, we'll be talking about um, papers. I think here that we want to target for the next release. Um, I think there's several different ways that we could carve up what we've done. I think we do want to set that as uh, a goal to have a manuscript, but again, uh, I'll leave that for the next bit. Um, there have been several presentations, and I'm pretty sure I don't have them all here, but um, but anyway, just some that had come to mind. So um, so Mike got to present on uh, Open Worm at a U Cambridge uh, meeting, his title I should I'll probably get. Um, so thank you, Mike, for carrying the torch there. Um, I know there was a Science Online SoCal uh, presentation that I gave. I gave one at a meeting here in La Jolla called Autonomous Neurodynamics. Um, and uh, Giovanni and Matteo both uh, helped me present a poster at the INCF Neuroinformatics 2012 in the last six months. Um, maybe something else there. There was also a mention or a plug for the Open Worm at uh, Open Source Brain presentations at CNS and the Combine meeting. Okay. CNS. But it was just a few slides. Okay, yes, thank you. I knew that there was other stuff. With you, thank you for doing that. Yep. Okay. Yes. All right, and then uh, external write ups. Uh, so we've had many, several mentions. I, I know I don't have an exhaustive list here, but we did get, we, we got a, a reference via uh, image in Scientific American. Um, oh, sorry. 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 Thank you. Um, uh, a, a, um, a reference, uh, a sort of indirect reference via New Yorker. Um, there was uh, a nice write up in a, a blog from research at Cambridge. Uh, several uh, blogs in the Spanish language actually uh, mentioned our, pro our project. Um, I think we got some comments on Reddit, and I think there's a few other assorted um, write ups in, in, in some uh, blogs on online across the web. But uh, this is picking up. Um, we, I mentioned last time that we got a um, we got a request from Wired UK. We learned in the last two weeks that um, that should be coming out in March of next year. So actually, quite a bit later than I expected. But um, we may get um, actually a, a large image. Uh, Matteo worked really hard one day to uh, optimize and high resify an image um, for that. So we may actually get a full page. Uh, spread in that, which is really nice. Um, I want to be sure that uh, when scientists come, uh, as a result of that uh, work, that they um, that they have a lot of meat uh, to see here that go beyond just the cool graphics. So um, I think that uh, we want to we want to be sure that we're ready for that in, in March. But um, 
but uh, that's been really promising. Yeah, and I think there was a Hacker News, uh, some Hacker News pointer as well. So um, I'm continuing to compile this um, even after this meeting, and I, I actually want to have links to all these things um, so that we can put that out to our community. But um, so thank you for that. Yeah, I, I will look that one up. All right, and then community building. Um, and again, I haven't really attributed these things yet, but um, you know, we, I, we started out um, finding ways, better ways to engage with community. Um, I've been hosting these office hour sessions on IRC. Um, chat logs from that have been available. There have been a handful of folks that have showed up to each. Um, hopefully that's going to expand as a way to continue to get questions from the outside community to let them know what, what's going on. Um, there was a whole self-computational model journal club hangout that we hosted, um, which was a good way to get out the word about our project. I think that was also just really interesting. Um, and then we continue to do interactions with Twitter, uh, Google+, Tumblr, on the mailing list. Um, by the way, those things are welcome to anyone. If, if anyone else wants to be a, a person who links or who creates posts on any of those sites, uh, Twitter, D+, Tumblr, those are all available to you. Um, you know, I, my, myself, and uh, Giovanni tend to be the ones to post on those things, but um, please let me know after the meeting if you want to, you know, have right access to that. You're welcome to it. Um, it would, you know, help. Um, and obviously the mailing list. So um, those are the main things. Um, I think this is a lot for um, six months and for a project uh, you know, that's run on volunteer time. Um, I think we have a lot to be proud of in this period. I think um, a lot of folks are really paying attention to what we're doing. And uh, I think we're making progress in what is obviously an extremely ambitious project to uh, reverse engineer uh, you know, a biological organism in silico. Um, you know, I think that it's because of all of you who believe that this project is possible that we've been able to make this, this progress. Um, I think that even though it's ambitious, I think the fact that we continue to see support from the community jumping on this, I really believe it's possible. And I think that next year is going to be um, really unbelievable, um, you know, given where we are now and where we have uh, yet to go. So um, how are we doing? Any, anybody want to comment before we move on to looking a bit towards the future. Okay. It's all good. All, good. all right. So, um, so the next uh, link then in here is uh, Candid Epics. Um, you guys click on that and see if you get something that looks like this, a mind map. Looks like some of you are on there now. Um, see some others joining in. Okay. Well, you can either see it on my screen or you can, you can see it yourself. Um, if you have the link, you should be able to, to edit this as well. But it's just my attempt to kind of try and consolidate uh, some of the different things that we've already done and some of the things that we could do in the future. Um, now, to be clear, um, as we've always said with this project, um, this is very much about um, you all um, you know, who are contributing to this, you know, as well as me. Uh, all of us arriving at what we want to do to, together. Um, so this is not an attempt to dictate you know, what we should do for the next six months, but it's at least just a compilation of some of the reasonable projects that we have started uh, doing, uh, some things that should probably continue, um, and uh, things that um, some additional things that I thought of that we could add. Um, but uh, ultimately, these things need to be owned and uh, driven by your, your efforts. Um, so these are just sort of the large categories. Um, I broke it up, as you can see, into engineering, science and research, and communications, which you know probably aren't um, the cleanest categories, but just as a way to have a higher level um, organization than um, these individual pieces. Um, this kind of cross cuts, I think, uh, a driving goal that we want to have for the project by, by the time we get to the end. Um, but um, just to kind of review the basic concepts of what we've been doing for the last, uh, you know, for the last six, um, six months. So just to kind of say at a high level, right? So we realized, I think, that a neuromechanical model is a reasonable skeleton for us to build to begin with to then use as a scaffold to fill out any additional intracellular activity. I think that the last, you know, the, the last several releases have shown us that that is uh, a reasonable thing for us to target given all the data integration we have to do, given all the engineering we have to do, given the optimization that we have to do. And then breaking that down even further, I think what we've also arrived at is that a single muscle cell is a place to begin with, uh, with that work. And then to 
to, to expand out from that muscle cell. The muscle cell is crucial because it both has physics and it has electrical activity. So we can create both a neuromel model and an SPH model of a single muscle cell. Can I can I just say something? Yes. I, I know I've said this before, but if we could get out of the habit of saying physics when we mean mechanics, I know it's a small thing, but yeah. I think it would be good to, to, to say mechanics when we mean mechanics and say... Uh, right. It's, okay, except so even mechanics isn't quite... Uh, it's closer. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, right, because right, what you're saying is that the physics of uh, the uh, membranes is also physics. Right. I know it seems like a very pedantic point, but in the presentation I gave a couple of weeks ago, I said physics because we say physics all the time and everyone jumped on me. Okay. Uh, no, 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 that's good. That's good. That's good. So, um, so, you, you, so you're, so you're, you're right. Um, so to have the, the mechanics of the muscle cell motion um, and to have the electrical activity of the muscle cell, we've seen has been challenging. And part of that challenge is that it's taken us a while to get a good model of the muscle cell. We have that now. It's taken us a while to implement the right blend of uh, mechanics and, and um, you know, liquid fluid mechanics. Um, and, and, and having that, we've re basically worked up until now where we are at a point now where we can integrate these two. Um, but then we also obviously want to work with the whole worm body, which also has these properties. So we have the whole connectome, and we have um, what's starting to look like a worm-shaped uh, a worm-shaped model. So we can both attack uh, at a single cell level and at a whole whole body level, but obviously the whole body is going to have less resolution than the single cell. So um, so what remains for us to do is to is to continue to basically work this depth and breadth. I think as the two main um, thrusts of the project. The depth being making sure that we have biology that fits with what, what is actually known and having uh, enough precision and detail in something like a muscle cell model that we can compare it to actual physiology, we can compare it to actual data. The breadth being that we don't lose sight of the fact that this is a muscle cell that's integrated into a larger organism and that organism is going to interact with an environment, it's going to have a full nervous system, it's going to have connections in that nervous system, um, and that we eventually want to push beyond a neuromechanical model into a model where all the cells are, are playing a role. Obviously, we know that peptides play an extremely large role with the, with, with the, the worm and that we can't really describe its, its full behavior until we include uh, the full body. So um, that's kind of the broad theme, the breadth and the depth I, I see for us you know, moving forward in order to kind of, as the themes, to pull together all of these different activities. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm continuing to flesh that out, and in fact, I'm working on writing this up in terms of text um, as a result of you know, our, our writing efforts. But so now with that in mind, let me just kind of go back to these different pieces. So communications, I think, is easiest for, all to un for us all to understand. We need to continue to progress on writing. So papers go under here, publications, our publication strategy. That's something that many of us are going to participate in. Community building is important for folks to understand what we're doing um, and for you know, to continue to recruit. You know, talented, motivated folks like you all, so that we can keep making this party bigger and um, and get more help uh, to work on this. Website is a key part of that. Data visualization is something that we haven't that we're starting to do now, I guess, with the simulation engine, and that I think that uh, folks continue to call for. Um, this goes hand in hand with community building and writing, because I think with a project that is kind of as complex as this one is, um, we can continue to benefit from being in a single picture. Uh, where the state of the project is, uh, how much data we have, and what's needed. Um, and so there are some efforts that we're putting in with some uh, volunteers that are coming into the project to actually use data visualization packages to, to do that. That's something that I'm continuing to, to, to report on. Data acquisition is something that we've done informally um, up until now um, that I've kind of, uh, you know, spearheaded but could basically be its whole, a whole topic. So we've uh, acquired data um, in the uh, muscle cell data. We've acquired data uh, from the Cook lab. And, I, and as we go forward, especially when we're talking about dynamics of motor neurons, it's going to be crucial that we acquire dynamical data about uh, motor neurons. And so this topic needs to be something that, you know, it's not necessarily a role that a single person takes up. I've basically been running it myself, but it's something that we you know, can continue to use help with, making sure that labs that have the appropriate data know about us, 
and um, are you know are excited about our progress and interested to see how um, their data represented in our model can actually bring insight back on their data. So data acquisition is an important part of communication, not directly a, a simulation or a science or research, uh, et cetera. So that's communication. OK, under uh, engineering, um, so we've got a few different topics. Um, so simulation engine uh, is the work that uh, you know we continue to do. This is a definitely a breadth topic, but making sure that um, we have a good code base uh, that uh, you know that will allow folks to come in and play with the model um, that is doing a good job of integrating the different algorithms. Um, you're familiar with this work. The muscle cell again, the sort of depth project, um, which is kind of cross-cutting both what's going on in the simulation engine, which wants to run the muscle cell, as well as work that you know Mike has been leading up to make sure that we um, have the you know that we know theoretically what all the pieces are that have to be there, and we do essentially a first pass that closes the loop um, on there so that we get you know rapidly to um, some results and we, um, we do some initial integration um, as we're folding it into the simulation engine. Uh, the mechanics engine work, uh, the SPH work that um, Andre and Sergey have, have done continues to move forward. Uh, the topics now include um, you know, refining issues of the boundaries between uh, liquid and, and uh, elastic as well as um, uh, shaping, uh, you know, actual entities out of the particles that uh, are simulated in SPH. Um, you know, shaping the body, shaping the muscle cell, defining how the shape should uh, work, as well as defining how forces interact with that on a, on a regular basis. Um, did I add motor neuron, or did somebody else add motor neuron? I, I put that in. I think okay. uh, when it just, uh, maybe not in in the next six months, like, but when it start thinking about it. I mean, I don't expect us to be to have a detailed model as we have it of the muscle cell, but we haven't been thinking about that at all. Yeah. So it's pro probably a mini project of like start investigating and collecting data and a bunch of stuff. So yeah. I, th I think we need to start thinking about that. That's just me. I don't know if ever the others agree or not. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I think it's great. I think it's great. I think it goes with data that we need to acquire. I think it goes with the ion channel stuff. Um, the, yeah, the model itself um, yeah. and, st and all that stuff. So the same that we did for the muscle cell, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Because that's the next step, like to have the motor neurons talk to the muscle cells. Um, I, I completely agree. Um, and also, we're learning some things about motor neurons recently that they may actually even be sensitive to stretch, stretching of the body, which is really interesting for us, uh, given that we're going to have the ability to simulate both. OK, and then, so science and research, again, I don't know if this is the best category, but I'm just trying to give some high-level categories here. So um, some things that we've already done, let's see, some of these are going to be familiar, and some of these I'm going to have to say why I think I think they continue to support. But obviously, so model optimization continues to be important for us because we, we are, um, we recognize that we don't have measurements for absolutely every parameter that we're going to need. Um, and we want to fill in those gaps with, uh, you know, using techniques from machine learning to help us get there. Um, we've taken great strides in this now recently, and we want to continue to push on this. Um, we're doing that for the muscle cell now. We're getting our process improved for that. Um, that's going to include, you know, what we do for, for the motor neuron and, and how we chain that out to um, a whole lot more parameters for the whole worm. Obviously, that's ambitious, but um, but it's exciting as well, and I and I and I'm confident that we're going to make great progress on this in the next uh, release. Uh, synapse position um, is going to continue to move forward. Again, we can't really simulate the dynamics until we have this down uh, fairly well. But we've got strong support from from Stephen Cook, who continues to help us out with this. So I'm I'm really excited to keep pushing that that forward. Um, let's see. Uh, so data integration has been. A topic that is something that I think kind of cross cuts a lot of the pieces, but it goes beyond data acquisition. So this, you know, goes into topics. Um, so this goes into topics such as the things that you know Andre has done in the past to actually, um, you know, uh, understand enough about the model to know, um, you know, the, so the appropriate sizes of things. Um, when it comes to the muscle, I know that uh, Andre has has been researching into you know the mass of the um, the muscle cell. So that we know that we can appropriately assign masses. Um, this goes into you know other research with um, 
you know, um, you know, integrating data like in, in model optimization. So this is another topic as well that I think can, um, we can have folks help us with uh, to kind of get a grip on all the data, understand what it is, and understand how it fits into the engineering. Uh, the last two are things which uh, I think are sensible um, that, um, that we haven't really made explicit categories yet, but I think are, are important. And as well as folks come in and help us, I think that's, that's useful. So, um, you know, one of the things that t projects like the Blue Brain has really spearheaded is um, making sure that they have, like, channel ML representations of ion channels and knowing that for all the neurons that they're working with, uh, understanding how far they are in getting a grip on what all the ion channels really are and should be. So I think we need to do the same thing here. And in fact, I think integrating it with existing channel databases um, is a smart thing to do. Um, we haven't really done that, and I don't know that the C. elegans community has much of that um, as such um, in terms of modeling. I think this is something something that we can really help to contribute to, and is kind of a, at the moment, kind of a blue skies project. Um, it relates to all of the work that we've been doing to collect data, but it's something that I think um, is, is crucial for us, and this is really the, the last thing we need to flesh out the connectome, other than the synapse positions, is, is an appropriate... Um, accounting of all of the ion channels and having good models. Hey, uh, uh, my, uh, Steve? Steve? Yeah. 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 Along with that is the neural peptide aspect of it because one of the interesting things I, I discovered is about two or three months ago, I was struggling with the concept of the plasticity within within the nervous system, right? So so I was thinking, well, if the, if the synapses and neurons are fixed, how, how does the worm learn? And I thought, well, probably the only way that could be accomplished would be through neuropeptides. And in fact, it was about a month ago I saw there was a paper out there where somebody has actually done that research and, and is now stating that that's the way the worm learns, is, is through the neuropeptide uh, uh, channels and, and, and process. So um, I think that's going to become very important to us. Uh, you know, along those same lines as the ion channels. I think that's right. I think that's right. And I think that we should we should also incorporate this into a database. Um, right now, um, right, ion channels have this channel ML description which make it very straightforward to think about. For neuropeptides, in addition to um, in addition to um, keeping a list, we also need to think about how we can actually represent the diffusion aspect of those guys. But you're absolutely right and in fact uh, for those of you on the Mendeley um, on the Mendeley database, I know that uh, I think I just added recently an essay. Yeah, um, this here by Corey Bargman, 2012 bio essays. I just added this in there. Beyond the connectome, how neuromodulators shape neural circuits. So this is really something that um, is is an important topic for this. And so I think that you're absolutely right. So I've just added that neuropeptide database here. So thanks for that, Tim. Um, and the last is, is connectome dynamics exploration. So this is one I think that um, is something that folks can come from the outside and really um, help us with as well. Um, and I'll just leave this as the last topic. Um, this is basically, right, so we've done this work now to, we actually have the connectome running in Neuron, right? And we do that, we can do that right now. And uh, we released a little video of that showing that we could do it, and then we basically never touched it again. And um, I think that we can do more to make it easy for someone to come in and just play with the current connectome loaded in, in Neuron. And I think that we can also use it as a way to teach people Neuron. And, and then um, what I'm hoping is to have people just play around with uh, the model in Neuron. Even though we know that it's missing a lot of things, I think that it would still just be interesting to have folks uh, enhance what they see and interact with the model and you know, maybe reveal... Uh -oh. Sorry, a young, a, young a, a new volunteer, perhaps, for the project uh, over there. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I think that we can also um, invite people to play with the model in, in, in neuron. I would be very careful about that until we're actually sure that it does something vaguely resembling a, a realistic circuit, because at the moment it is just a very. Uh, there's so many parameters that are completely. Uh, picked picked out of the sky that um, if it does anything it's a huge coincidence that it does anything realistic so before people before you actually show it to people and because because it's very easy for anybody to assume that any of the given parameters uh, have been tested or are reasonable and if it does something 
ridiculous or if it does something realistic, it's it's difficult to know whether it's doing it because they're in the right ballpark or what. But so so I'm aware I'm aware of those caveats, and I think this has been the reason why you've been hesitant to to put it out. But I mean, what do you think about you know making those caveats like you know like 16 point font and making it very clear wh exactly what we're what we're saying with this model right now, making the assumptions very large, but at least letting people you know play with you know with things you know in there. Um, it, it, this is all I'm saying. Like we wouldn't publish a paper saying that it's right. I mean, obviously that's still what we're we're aiming at. But I think for folks coming, so you know, I, folks email me and they say, hey, you know, the project is neat. How can I help? And um, one of the things that I've been looking for is ways to be able to point somebody to something and say, well, you know, learn, learn Neuron, right? And then that's just like you know, a way for somebody to play you know, with st stuff that we've done. Learn Neuron and try running the model or try to delete all the cells except for you know, the, one, the one crazy sensory neuron, right? And mm -hmm. play with it, right? It, it would at least be a way that we're not letting that connectome sort of just sit. Um, and it also, I think, will help us to... Um, be sure that we're publishing it, publishing these things in a way that the, that the community can, can interact with. So I, I completely understand about the caveats, but I, yes. I don't know. Would would I'm, would it be reasonable? Uh, yes, but I, I think there are, there are a lot of fairly low hanging fruit at the moment, long ish but low hanging fruit of actually finding out what models are out there of, for example, um, uh, invertebrate neurons, and trying to get some of these into. Uh, Neuron, get them into NeuroML, get them onto Open Source Brain, and uh, so that there's, uh, uh, for example, uh, some of the um, more kind of abstract, well, slightly more abstract models that Netacone has done that mm -hmm. don't have the full connectome but do have spiking integrating fire neurons, uh, realistic uh, co connectivity or semi realistic connectivity, and maybe even a kind of more abstract. Um, uh, re physical representation. I'm sure there are a lot more of these out there for Drosophila, for various other types of um, cells, and building up sets of these, looking at these, would be a good step towards saying, okay, well now we have a general idea of what types of channels are present in, um, uh, in invertebrate uh, neurons, what type of synaptic properties are out there. I'm sure there are models of uh, invertebrate synapses out there and these can slowly be put together as a kind of and, and integrated into the uh, full connectome uh, model but to jump and to the full model and claim that it does anything realistic it's, it's going to confuse more people than it um, uh, yeah than it helps I think to be honest unfortunately why well, okay well we can continue to talk about it I I wouldn't claim anything, but um, but I, I I hear what you're saying. Like, I I I, th I think it, it is nice to put these caveats, but people will look at it and think that it's a realistic model. Unfortunately, if it looks like a C. elegans and if it uh, spikes a bit, um, people will think right. Okay, well that's a starting point. It's, it doesn't have everything, but we'll go with that and see what it does. And I'm guilty of it myself, just taking down a model from ModelDB and thinking, right, well, it's in the right ballpark. We'll start from here, and let's go with that. Everybody does it, and it's even more tempting when there's a full model. And But again, I'm, maybe I'm just being too cautious, but yeah. OK, well, well we can talk more about it. I, I certainly, so I've added the aggregating detailed invertebrate models. I think that's actually a very good uh, thing to do. And, um, and uh, so. So again, so you know, this project is driven by by all of you. So um, nobody's going to do anything they don't want to do. Um, so I think that um, the things that folks are more passionate about are, is what's ultimately going to drive um, is going to drive the future of the project. So um, I guess um, now, uh, so we've got uh, you know 30 minutes left. So I've sort of been monologuing this whole time. Um, I I want uh, folks to sort of kick around. So what's missing from this, um, and uh, what is you know. In addition to kind of uh, the basic um, these basic areas, um, are there another are there other major areas, and what are the things that folks really um, want to put priority on for themselves um, going forward? And I'll basically just go around to everybody here and, and sort of take take folks' temperature on it um, uh, because this has been my uh, template, but uh, you guys have to obviously fill it in and let me know what what's next. So let me start with Mike actually. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me all? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I suppose 
what I'm really interested in is what happens once we get um, a model, a, a muscle cell model, whereby so right now what I've achieved is um, the integration in the sense that the SPH simulation can run. Uh, it can run a neural simulation, but so it can receive parameters from a neural simulation, but doesn't do anything with them, right? But um, Andre and Sergey are working on the fluid contraction now. So once once that work is at a reasonable stage, it should be fairly straightforward to to get to integrate the neural system with, or some kind of neural system, some kind of, can you hear me all? Yep. Okay. Yep. So, what I'm, so what I'm saying is, what, I, what I'm quite interested in is can we do some interesting science once we have the systems, once, once we have the, the SPH integrated with the electrophysiological model of the muscle, can we do some interesting science? Um, yeah, so... That's, that's so, uh, something which... So to frame this, um, so I was actually I was actually chatting with Andre yesterday, and we got onto the topics of publications. I know this came out a little bit on the on the um, on the chat, and so we so there's Belash's you know paper, um, but then I think there's um, I think there's room. I don't, I don't know I don't know necessarily this would be Belash's paper, but I think there's room for a SPH. Um, uh, you know, pyramidal, um, you know, optimization, uh, combination with neuron paper potentially around around the muscle cell, which I think would be nice because there's there's real muscle cell data um, that we're we're using. Um, there's advances on the on the mechanics. There's advances on uh, some of the software tools. Um, it would be you know be a Mike, Andre, Sergey, uh, anybody else who wants to you know contribute you know in, in that sort of thing. Um, but it seems like that would be shaping up just to do a muscle cell um, for a, for a midterm type publication target. Is sort of what I'm thinking about, and that would yes. then frame that goal of publication would then frame the software development out to get there um, in, in the interim period. Um, what do you folks think about that? Yeah. Um, if I, I guess, I guess what it depends on is the the status of the uh, whole question with the SPH solver of once when will <laughs> sorry I'm, I'm a bit stuck for words today. I guess the question would be how far are we with the whole contraction of the fluid in the SPH solver, and I know Andre wanted to talk about this because. It's it's a bit hard to speculate about papers and so on if, we, if, if we're uncertain. So I mean, he, he just dropped off. But from what I what I understood from yesterday, and, and Sergey, if if I'm if I want to know, um, so the you know, this algorithm is challenging uh, because every time you've reached a milestone, there's new challenges uh, to reach. So once you've got once you've got uh, soft body, which they got, and then you got to get the soft body to work with the liquid, which they got. But now, apparently, the liquid penetrates the soft body boundaries, and the liquid particles get stuck. So it's like it's they get wet. But I think that like screws up the simulation. So this causes very unrealistic activity when the when when this penetration is happening. So the next the next sort of topic is making a a reasonable boundary and calculating a reasonable boundary between the surface of the of the soft body. And the liquid. And my understanding is that right now, they, this is an issue that they hadn't anticipated, um, but that they need to solve uh, before they can really move on to contraction in a serious way. Is, is currently what they're thinking. But um, they're, they're, you know, every issue that has come up, they have, uh, they have, uh, you know, they licked it and uh, moved past it. And um, so I'm confident that they will as well. But it's just the nature of the beast right now. Um, is that sure. Is that, is that about right, Sergey? Uh, yes. Um, so I, I'm I'm confident that like we'll get those pieces going, and I think that um, you know doing a, a close close the loop integration like what you're doing, Mike, is is good for everything. It's good for um, you know motivating 
the mechanics work to move forward. It's also good for um, the simulation engine integration uh, because it means the code base will be will have the right hooks in it to uh, move forward. It means that we'll you know, be doing more work. You know, more eyeballs that have to integrate with the library means that it's easier for us all to build it and then port it and then uh, you know all that sort of stuff. Um, and I and I think that um, it also helps because it's really a good team effort. You know. Um, they haven't done any model optimization optimization side on the mechanics side, so it kind of comes together fairly fairly well. Anyway, we don't have to decide, you know, for sure right now. But can I, I can I come back in one minute? I'm sorry, I know it's about time. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> I just need to talk fine. to someone. Yep, yep. That's okay. So it gives us a good chance to sort of segue um, into uh, to the next topic. So, um, so Matteo, uh, what are you thinking? Hey, sorry about that. Okay, well, we've moved sorry. on in the so um, okay. we'll, come, we'll come back. Just think, think, think in the back of your mind about about the idea of that publication. Uh, can I yeah. Get well, all I wanted to say, sorry, I'm sorry, to come back to this, is a uh, just really quick point. Uh, if if we can get the whole contraction, if we can get the if the SPH the contraction stuff works, then we could uh, integrate that with the neural stuff. I think quite easily, and definitely there's a publication in that. Yeah, yeah I think that's reasonable. So, Matteo. Okay. Um, two things I was uh, thinking about. The um, one thing is the simulation engine is a big ball, just put like this, and. I think it would be useful just to get down to the very macro components that are incorporated there just to really appreciate the kind of uh, work that needs to be done. And uh, I'm mostly speaking about uh, the neuronal solver. Okay, so neuronal solver is, uh, is going to be a big task. We haven't even started it. We just have a prototype that needs to be rewritten. But mm, it's not that it needs to be rewritten because it's bad. It needs to be rewritten because it was never meant to be good. It was just a proof of concept. They didn't use NeuroML. It was just a single compartment. There were lots of R coding. So I would explicitly put the neuronal solver. And I see there that you're putting multi-compartment neural solver, which is something that we need. And obviously, that adds even more challenges than a single compartment. So, OK. The other thing that I would add, if this is going to turn into an R4 plan, is that I would um, uh, see all of this is kind of putting together in, um, uh, in, one, uh, in one place all the different things that we need to do. But from a planning perspective, I, would, I, I think it would be useful to have some names associated to each one of these things okay. in, the sen in the sense that uh, some people taking, uh, I'm going to use a strong word, but responsibility for an area so yeah. that we know that uh, for that person that is taking responsibility for that area, the objective is going to be doable for six months. And uh, then uh, we can see how much of these actually fits in in a release and how much of these needs to be moved forward to another release. I would rather do these and uh, have something which is mm, more realistic and close to what we can actually deliver as opposed to always have everything and then just considering the subset of the things that we achieved at the end of the release. I think it, uh, I just think it would be useful to be more realistic in considering the bandwidth, the resources that we currently have, and obviously if someone has joined this project, uh, then we can revise it and add more stuff. Uh, but I would do this that we didn't quite do last time, so just to avoid the risk of having too much stuff on the plate. I agree. But under, and also, under something the, we just sorry, go ahead. something we discussed last time, which we never really did in a very formal way, would be to have subgroups. And I know I know Matteo is keen on that, 
but to have subgroups which with like regular meetings and you know we're working on this aspect and we're working on this aspect and we have a meeting every three weeks or whatever I think that would be really good right I so think we have, done, we have done to some extent uh, for the simulation engine with Sergey and Gleb before he jumped off but uh, we've been kind of doing that for the simulation engine which is the group that basically we we're working in uh, it, it hasn't happened for other areas, maybe, and we probably should do a better job at that. So, the, so one of the things, so a suggestion that came in recently um, was to utilize the mailing list more, and that was one of the bullets on my on, on the agenda there. Um, and uh, I just kind of wanted to throw that open. So, um, you know, uh, somebody from the outside, again, who hasn't been participating with us, sort of said, like, well, why do you do this hangout? Why don't you use the mailing list more? Um, the hangout obviously takes a lot of time. And um, I think that um, I, I, well, before I bias it, what do you guys think? Um, do you well, um, if I can go first, I think that you cannot replace the hangout with the mailing list. It's two different things. The hangout is uh, just a touch base, and it's once every two weeks. The mailing list is something that's supposed to happen continuously, asynchronously. So we probably need to do a better job at using it. I think uh, if people uh, are not too happy that they're receiving too many messages, they're free to drop off the mailing list. And it's to become a tool that uh, basically we use for communication. Obviously, if, if something is uh, very detailed or very specific or we are not comfortable that it's in the mailing list, then okay. But if it's like uh, stuff that it's good to have in the open, even to show what we are doing and stuff, then I see no reasons not to use it. Because, I mean, there are emails going back and forth, it's just that we never use the mailing list the, the way that it's probably supposed to be used. I think uh, it won't replace the Hangouts. We still need to meet. Uh, but, yeah, I agree that we could use it more. Does anybody have a contrasting perspective? Yeah, go ahead. Well, would it be useful to have a use this current mailing list for uh, mainly for announcements, and then have a discuss open worm discuss for kind of the more detailed stuff? Or I mean, you do I mean there are sixty odd people on the mailing list, so you do want to keep them. Yeah. Uh, you do want to in announce the important things there, but uh, you also want to have the detailed discussions on this Synapse um, database or whatever uh, that everybody okay. can. Everybody here so you're, you're proposing two different mailing lists, one for kind of announcements and stuff, and another one for wor the working gr yeah. details, like the work, like working group mailing list. Yeah. I mean, it would um, be very good to have, I mean, there are a lot of people, and uh, it would be good to have one fairly detailed mail, well, one fairly high-profile mail every two weeks or something on the main mailing list. Uh, for example, um, the summary of these uh, recent accomplishments and so on that uh, people would be interested in seeing. Um, and but I mean, there, there are kind of smaller discussions on the muscle cell model and so on that maybe everybody here wants to see all these mails, but won't necessarily read them all um, and be on the, that mailing list by default. But um, you don't necessarily want to send. A, well, you can, but um, you don't necessarily have to have those on the main mailing list. I think Mike. My, I don't quite disagree. I just think that people, in theory, this works quite well, but I don't know in, in reality. Has anyone here ever thought, oh, well, because people do this, people have their announce mailing list and their technical discussions mailing list. Has anyone here ever gone like, oh, I'll sign on to the announce mailing list because I don't want the techni technical discussions, but I, I haven't, but maybe you guys have, I don't know. So, Mike, you yeah. haven't in the sense that you always go to the announcement, you always go to the technical, you go to... I always just go to the... I always just go to the technical one just have a to do a weekly digest or something but maybe maybe uh, maybe not everyone's like me so I shouldn't assume that the, same, we, same the only right. confusion is uh, it, it gets more difficult to communicate which one is for what and mm. that, that well, is the only Steven is the only one uh, as coordinator that uses the announcement ones just delivering uh, updates to the public and we all use that technological one that is there also for uh, the public, like it's open. I guess, um, yeah, I, mean, I guess the way, the way to do it would be to, to create the, to leave everyone that's on the current one where, the, where they are and create another one and we start using that one for the technical stuff. 
and yeah. then we, we, on the website somewhere with the OEF2, one for the announcements, uh, one for the technical stuff. But we, we, it's mean, not like uh, we, we, those guys who are already on the mailing list stay there. Like. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you just have to um, make sure there's something important or fairly interesting goes out every one to two weeks uh, on the main mailing list, and we can discuss. I mean, everybody here will be on the tech, technical mailing list. And we just discuss every idea that comes into your head there, and I'm sure those people here would, wouldn't uh, would be happy to get all those discussions. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, you want to call it open worm discuss or which one? The technical yeah, high, high volume. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Or discuss. Yeah, maybe discuss. I'm just looking for something that has relatively few letters. Um, okay. And it'll be also an open list that anybody can join? Yeah. Yeah. I would say so, yeah. Okay. Maybe moderator, as the current one is now, we all have access to it, but uh, if someone new comes, we need to approve, otherwise it's a bunch of spam. So the reason I, I asked this was in, in reference to Mike's reminder that we were going to break this up into projects. Um, and this whole question of like how to break it up in projects. So. Um, do folks want to also have standing meetings for uh, other topics related to? You know what? I think I think the right way to do this. Now that I'm thinking about it, the simulation engine kind of created an, a, another meeting because it thought it should. I think that that's the way that you know we should go as well. It shouldn't be. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. We should. I think meetings. every every sub group should uh, organize self organize and like to say yeah. we meet every. Wednesday, I don't know, whenever the, the members of maybe, that subgroup. Maybe it would be useful to define those subgroups so, and to have so, uh, someone. I mean, I, I think they can be fairly fluid, but I think if there is a high volume discuss mailing list, then yeah. each of these groups can maybe prefix their mails and say what they're doing, but these can be fluid. And, and I, I think most of the core people will be interested in everything that's happening and interested yeah. if any of these people are meeting. Uh, if you have separate mailing lists or separate way group groupings, it just kind of things go on that you don't necessarily hear about. But um, I think everybody here and everybody, yeah, a group of ten or twenty people will be interested in everything, and um, you can have that out there in public. And if the, when the actual Skype meetings or whatever ha happen, then people, the people actually working on it, can join up. Okay. So, so no, no, no debate. I'll, I'll uh, add the open worm discuss list. I'll put everybody here on it. I'll also, um, in, in my Announce. announcement, yeah. I'll, I'll let people know that the purpose of that list is being changed. Uh, I'll invite others to join the higher volume list if they like. Um, and then let me just encourage everyone here, um, with, when it comes to having sub-projects, um, don't be shy. Uh, if you want to propose a meeting around a topic, um, yeah. just do it. Right? And I'm, I'm kind of looking at Mike here as you're sort of Turning into an integrator kind of role as well, I think, between many of these different folks. So um, you feel free to join the simulation engine meeting if you like. But I think that also the um, what you're doing is um, also reusing these code bases, but doing it in a way that's kind of focused on getting to a scientific end. Whereas I think that the simulation stuff is focused on getting to first an engineering end in service of yeah. the same scientific end that you're shooting for too. So I think you should feel free to. Um, just create a, a, a meeting that needs to be a standing meeting. I'll leave that to you to decide. Um, and, and, and obviously the folks that you invite, because maybe folks are in the meeting. But I think it should it should be fluid that way. So um, okay. same goes for anybody. Porg, if you want to propose meetings. Andre, Tim, anybody wants to propose a meeting, feel free to do it. Um, we'll have this one as the regular one to check in, but uh, I think that's... that's but I do, uh, I should feedback. say that... Oh, okay, yeah. I, I should say that I'm enjoying the increase in activity on the discuss mailing list. Yeah. No, I think it's good. Right. That's, that would be the other thing, which is I encourage everybody to... I, and I have trouble with it myself sometimes. Um, I think that having this high volume list will make me feel better about it. But just throw, throw, the, throw the mailing list on the end of your email um, if it's an open worm related mail, um, in, in, unless it's extremely private. Um, but um, I think that will help everybody to and, and have a track record. And, yeah, I think it helps uh, to stay in the loop with areas that we are not directly involved with. So you you, you will read the mailing list. I mean, if you see an email coming in, you you will look at it unless it's like uh, very long. 
but uh, so basically, it's just a way to keep everybody in the loop. Uh, and we're ten. We're like, how many people are in this hangout? Like eight people. So it's like it's not it's not like we're fifty people. Right. It's yeah. it's still to the point that uh, it's nice to be in the loop uh, with all the different stuff that's going on. Right. Absolutely. I think. And as other as other volunteers jump on, potentially they can interact more asynchronously on the discuss list. Yeah, and uh, again on the subgroups thing, it should be self organization driven thing. As in, it doesn't need to be every Tuesday or every. If the subgroup feels the need to meet regularly on a Wednesday or whatever other day, then it emerges. It will emerge that way. So for us, it was initially sporadic and then we found ourselves having a meeting every week and say okay let's do it Monday uh, right now sometimes we skip a week sometimes we skip two sometimes we do it for three weeks in a row so it it depends on if we have the need to speak about talk about stuff and, or not and uh, and so forth so uh, I think it's we need to leave it to whoever is working on the given topic and you just need to be more have more initiative Call a call in a meeting when there is something to discuss. Important, and we, we can try with emails. And if it's something that uh, cannot be resolved with emails on the public mailing list, discuss whatever, then call a meeting or something. Agreed. Okay, so we have ten minutes left, and I want to keep us to time. Uh, I want to give a chance to folks who haven't spoken as much to to speak here on their general concept of what they want to see going forward, and. Um, and I'm going to take Matteo's suggestion to mark names on, on things, but we're going to do it after the meeting. So we've got the basic flow here on this on this plan, but we're going to make this a lot more specific, and we're going to ask folks to basically uh, you know um, sign up for roles, um, if you will, uh, going forward, so that this gets more concrete. But we will, like I said, take that offline. Um, so right now, I just want to go around and, and and hear from other folks in terms of you know, next next steps. You haven't spoken, so let's. Let's go to Andre, um, and I'm going to just give you two minutes um, on the clock here, so we make sure we get around. So, Andre, um, next six months, um, what do you see? Uh, where are we going? Uh, what would you like to do? Mm, well, um, first of all, about um, the blog uh, in which I'm going to participate. Um, uh, my name is a uh, uh, continue the work um, with uh, physics uh, simulations. Um, we plan to move from a uh, general um, uh, physics, uh, physical objects like liquid and elastic matter to a uh, more specific, um, which are connected with uh, the uh, biology we are going to simulate. Well, um, so it will be a, a specific uh, realizations of um, membranes, uh, muscles, uh, maybe uh, single cells, um, so parts of the worm um, from a uh, biophysical uh, point of view. Uh, it will cause us to make um, additions to the um, physics simulator which uh, are designed for taking all these uh, specific components to be uh, taken into account. So oh, this is um, quite interesting and uh, new uh, work for all of us and um, of course it will uh, bring new results in this field uh, and will uh, allow the project uh, at all uh, to continue um, to um, achieve any results. And well, for the next um, field in which I would like to participate is um, something um, connected with uh, neuronal simulations because I'm very interested in this uh, field from the very beginning. This is the main uh, purpose, and physics, <laughs> biophysics is um, on the uh, supplementary, but uh, still very necessary for um, making all this uh, work because um, 
neural network uh, shows uh, how it works uh, only when you have a body which is driven by muscle or system. Um, but well, all this for neural network, and I would like to participate in this again uh, to understand all the process which take part, uh, again from uh, single ionic channels to uh, general processes which drive uh, warm behavior and so on. Okay, awesome. Um, you need to move on to, to Sergey here so that we don't run out of time, but um, I took down some notes on those things, so that's awesome. Um, let me, let me keep, keep this moving. Again, I don't want to go over. Sergey, how about you, sir? Okay. Yep. Uh, I also uh, want to uh, continue my work on this page and uh, trying to improve uh, some part of this. Uh, also trying to help Andre with his work uh, and to work on narrow mail maybe uh, uh, trying to do something uh, useful <laughs> project. You're getting your PhD next year, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. I'm writing thesis. Wow. Yeah, well, so several of us can, can uh, commiserate. And your thesis is going to relate to what you're doing for Open Worm, yeah? Yes, sure. Most, most part. All right. Very good. Okay, thank you. Um, Tim? Yeah, I'm going to continue to uh, work on the data mining okay. and, and um, in the data visualization. But um, I just want to add that, uh, you know, anybody in the group that is looking for specific data, uh, don't be afraid to um, throw it my way. So even if you think you might have the data, don't hesitate to, um, you know, ask me to, to try to dig, dig stuff up because... Uh, sometimes we always find that uh, one paper says one thing and something else might say something slightly different. So, um, yeah, well, that's what I plan on doing. Okay, good. Okay, great. Um, and let's see. So now we got five minutes left. Folks who've already said something, but maybe not said everything they want to say. So, um, uh, Andre, did you have anything else? Um, well, I'm planning to um, put into Dropbox a few uh, slides. Uh, I haven't uh, com completed um, uh, every of them, but but a few uh, I'm ready to look at. Um, well, I think they would be useful for some understanding of what I'm going to do in the next uh, weeks. So, just a few moments and I will uh, put a link into Dropbox. Okay, great. Um, so, Porg, um, how about you in terms of, you said some things about invertebrate model gathering, but uh, other stuff yeah. related to the project? Yeah, I mean, for the next few months, uh, what would be very good for me, my point of view is um, getting more of the physiological details together, but I mean, that's definitely happening with the spreadsheets there, and I think we just need to uh, consolidate them or get one single point and pull out more information from those. I do think, again, that uh, there's a lot to be done with a lot of existing models out there of single cells and micro circuits, and getting as many of those together, investigating those would feed, all of those will have to feed into the kind of uh, full-scale model. Um, the cyber elegance, actually, um, the existing cyber elegance code might be a candidate for uh, looking at a reduced level physical model. So it might be useful getting a NeuroML version of that or getting that on open source brain in some way. Um, and um, yeah, so I mean, basically getting an, a number of these more abstract, smaller scale models together and getting as many of the parameters out, out of uh, these would be quite useful. Okay. All right. Uh, when 
one other thing I should mention, um, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it before, that we're planning an open source brain meeting uh, next May, uh, which will hopefully be happening in Sardinia. So um, details are still sketchy a little bit at the moment, uh, so maybe that's something that people can bear in mind if uh, we want to try to get a uh, get together at some point. Mateo and myself will definitely be going, um, and then hopefully some other of you will be going. So. Um, but yeah, more details will be uh, hopefully in the presentation. It would be a perfect location for an open world retreat. Awesome. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, so, inserting some of Mike, the typing. Sorry. I'm yeah. writing you an email. Okay. All right, last yes. bit. Uh, Giovanni, um, other stuff that uh, we hadn't. Uh, <laughs> the stuff that we that uh, you hadn't got a chance to touch on. Oh uh, yeah, well, pretty happy about uh, what we talked about. I just, in terms of what I'm gonna working on myself for the next period, is gonna be embarking on the porting of the SPH, the latest version that Andrei and Sergey put together. Sergey was uh, very kind, and he put together a list of a trace of changes from the latest snapshot that we ported the Java to the current version of the C++ code, so that's going to help a lot. So, yeah, that's probably... And other than that, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be spending most of my time on the simulation engine stuff, uh, technology stuff, plus the porting of the SPH, and I'd like to be involved with the neuronal simulator uh, when we start working on that. Okay. Terrific. All right, guys. So we got one minute to go. Um, so um, we'll close now. Um, Mike. Um, so this, I know topics that we didn't get to talk about as much. Um, I would like to talk more about the model optimization. Um, would you like to set up a meeting for that, or should I? Um, go ahead. Yeah, you can set up a meeting for that. Me and Alex are already talking about stuff we're working on, what we're planning to work on. So. Yeah, it means Alex started doing stuff today already, but yeah, so okay, yeah, send actually, an email on. Yeah, maybe maybe we can loop that in on the on the mailing list as well. Um, that I'm going to talk to you, so I think we can do that. And um, uh, okay, I'm sure there's several updates that we didn't get a chance to talk about now. But so, like I said, next steps: uh, create this mailing list. I'm going to finalize the release um, accomplishments. So I'll be sending that out to the list. Um, we will be structuring these areas that we've got uh, in this uh, mind map into something a bit more formal, um, getting more of a plan around it. Um, I'll be working with some of you to help do that. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think we're good to go. So we'll do this again in two weeks. Uh, we'll start off on our new, our new directions, um, which are kind of continuations, I think, of some of the old directions, but now reinvigorated. So um, again, thank you all for an awesome release. Um, you guys, um, you know, you guys uh, are really rocking it, and I think that, again, like I said at the beginning, we're going to see this project go even farther than it already has um, in 2013 uh, to, to places we didn't, we've never expected. So, um, one thing is, by, nec <laughs> by next time, is uh, are we going to think about some epics or what? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we, yeah. We, we need to come up with some epics. Uh, for the meeting, I guess. Yeah, that's the structuring that I'm going to be. I'm going to be doing. Okay. Maybe, okay. Uh, let me work with you guys to sort of start start that and send it out. Um, and so we all have, have consensus, but I think that can be done. Yeah. Okay. All right. Awesome guys. Thank you so much. Uh, check out Andre's slides that he just posted there in in, uh, in Dropbox. So. See you later. Okay. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.